Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Danielle Rahajasan, and on behalf of the National Center for Medical Legal Partnerships and our panelists, um, I want to thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedules today to attend this session. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, uh, which is the first part of a four-part series that unpacks uh, the learnings from the toolkit we developed uh, that provides the health center community with information and resources to start strengthen and sustain a medical legal partnership. Um, today's session will uh, focus on laying the foundation and funding the model. Um, you can find this toolkit on NCML, um, CMLP's website as well as uh, in the handout pane on the drop down menu of your toolbar. Next slide please. We also want to acknowledge that this project is uh, supported in full by the Health Resources and Services Administration and that the contents are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official views of um, HRSA or HHS or the US government. Next slide, please. In just a moment, I will turn uh, this presentation over to our panelists, but before that, I have a few small housekeeping things I would like to run through with everyone. Um, you all joined on mute for today's session. However, we do encourage you to type in your questions in the chat if it is a desktop uh, app and in the question pane uh, at any time uh, as it will be an opportunity for us to connect and have a very rich discussion around our topic today. Uh, today's audio recording and slides will be made available uh, by the end of this week on the resources page of the National Center for Medical Legal Partnership website and uh, we will share that link with you shortly. Um, there will also be a very brief survey uh, that will launch at the end of this webinar. So your participation and responses do really help us learn more about your needs and how to continue to improve our events. Next slide, please. If you need additional information about this webinar, um, please don't hesitate to email uh, ncmlp at gw.edu and I'll put that in the chat as well. Um, for today, we have three major learning objectives, uh, which are to learn how to start a medical legal partnership to address the social and legal needs of patients, and how to fund a successful MLP, and also how to implement MLP considering the challenges that may be related um, to that. Next slide, please. We do have an amazing panel uh, today, and we want to thank them uh, tremendously for helping us out with this event. First, we'll be joined by Bethany Hamilton, who is the co-director here at the National Center for Medical Legal Partnerships. Uh, we will also be joined by Anne Mangimelli, uh, who is the managing attorney of the Health Education and Law Project, or HELP, at Legal Aid of Nebraska. Um, HELP partners with healthcare systems across the state to provide legal services to patients uh, to address legal needs, which inhibit patient health. Uh, Mangimelli practices in the areas, areas of domestic relations, Social Security, Disability, Medicare, Estate Planning, Guardianship, and Advanced Directives. Additionally, she has served as a speaker at both local and national conferences on MLP and was appointed to the Advisory Council on Public Guardian for the state of Nebraska and served as the vice chair. She is also an adjunct pro professor at uh, Creighton University School of Law and serves on the law school's Health Law Program uh, Board of Advisors. Uh, we are also joined today by uh, Brad Meyer, who has been the Chief Executive Officer at Bluestem Health for over seven years. Uh, Bluestem Health is a federally qualified health center operating under a board of directors structure. He has over 20 years of experience managing teams, including 13 years as a senior executive for multi-site, multi-million dollar healthcare operations, such as in Nebraska and Iowa. So without further ado, I'm now going to pass it on to Bethany. Thank you, Danielle. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, before we get into the specifics, I'm going to provide a high level national sort of overview of health center based MLPs. So first, let's do some true level setting here for folks who may not be as um, familiar with health centers or civil legal services. Next slide. What's a health center? For those of you who are completely new to this, um, 
the health center program, uh, primarily we're looking at federally qualified health centers. Those are ones that may uh, be HRSA funded, meaning they have the Section 330 Public Health Service Act grant, or they might be a look like and operate just like a Section 330 grant funded health center that has as their priority serving the underserved and vulnerable populations in medically underserved areas. Um, the majority of uh, health center funds actually don't come from Section 330. They are actually from, for operating funds, Medicaid, Medicare, private insurance, patient fees, and other resources as you see on the screen. All in all, health centers have as their mission and mandate really providing that comprehensive culturally competent care, providing services to individuals regardless of their ability to pay and charging photo services on a sliding fee scale. And then uh, generally, who are they? Um, these health centers are private, nonprofit, or public entities, which also includes your tribal and faith-based or faith-based organizations. Lots of requirements, right, to call yourself a health center. There are also different types of ones. There are homeless uh, healthcare for the homeless programs. Your migrant health centers are the different subtypes of health centers. Um, and right now, they're serving almost 30 million people, estimated to go well over that number in the next year. What about civil legal aid on the next slide, the basics, for those of you who are completely unfamiliar with, and I hope those there are folks tuning in who are trying to understand, well, what are, what are we talking about when we talk about civil legal services? Like, what is that? I know what a lawyer is, but what does civil legal aid even mean? From DOJ, Civil Legal Aid 101 is defined as free legal assistance to low and middle income people who have civil legal problems. I just wanna make a note about free. Remember, nothing is free, right? It's just free to whom the ultimate recipient of those services, the clients, right? These are primarily your grant, your LSC grant funded uh, organizations who are addressing civil legal problems, those non, criminal matters such as housing, healthcare, securing government uh, entitled benefits, uh, helping people address employment matters or educational barriers, some family law issues as well. Um, and the people who are providing those services are primarily your direct services legal aid attorneys. Um, they, they may provide direct representation, provide advice and counseling to individuals, they may also, as will come up in the MLP example, address more systemic issues through policy change. Um, and then sometimes, as we uh, have all done in the civil legal services world, we're providing a lot of community education, right? Because as you see on the screen, according to the data from the LSE 2017 Justice Gap Report, 71% of low-income households have experienced at least one civil legal problem in the past year. A large majority of them will not receive uh, the legal services that they need. It's just a matter of capacity. So on the next slide, speaking of capacity, how do we work together? What's the value and, and benefit of really collaborating to meet the growing needs of both of these populations, the populations that are medically underserved, that health centers serve, and that are in need and such dire and great need as we saw throughout the pandemic for civil legal services. This is where MLPs come into the picture. So how do we collaborate? Next slide. Through the medical legal partnership approach, we are intervening as legal and healthcare professionals to collaborate to help the patient population or clients, depending on where you're coming from, resolve their social, economic, and environmental factors that are contributing to those health disparities and may have a remedy in civil law. We are beginning to see um, additional innovative medical legal partnerships who are also partnering with offices like public defender offices to address those civil legal problems that individuals inter encountering the justice system, criminal justice system, might be uh, facing as well. So the definition um, is on the screen, but the different models vary greatly around the country. Next slide. And uh, how do we, how else do we define MLP? Uh, many of you have heard our presentations before and you, you're familiar with what we're calling this pizza pie slice. It's also in our health center MLP toolkit. Um, basically, when you're embedding lawyers as members of your healthcare teams, what you're doing is you're bringing those lawyers in to address uh, patients' social needs with legal underpinnings through direct legal assistance. Those lawyers might be, and the legal teams, might be addressing the need for trainings to help the health center workforce build their capacity to address the social determinants of health. There might be some clinical level changes and keep traveling up the spectrum of services that can be provided by an MLP 
policy change strategies. MLP happens to be one of the uh, few models of partnerships where you are traveling along a spectrum from patients to policy work, and ultimately you're creating healthier patients, stronger workforce, and improving health equity. All right, so next slide. Let's take, for example, what one of the benefits are of having a medical legal partnership. So, for example, on the screen you see you have a family of four where a mom who is receiving cancer treatment is really unable to keep up with rent because she has to go to the cancer treatment appointments, right? So she's unable to work regularly. Without that um, income coming in uh, or the ability to show up, her employment is at short term, her, excuse me, her income is at immediate uh, direct risk and her long-term employment status is also at risk. By that mom showing up into her healthcare provider's offices, if they have a community health worker, for example, who's conducting the screenings, that CHW can help that mom apply for benefits, right, that might support the entire family while she's in cancer treatment. Then a case manager or social worker will help identify some additional sorts of support, gather medical documentation, and a lawyer can also step in to help advise that patient of her rights under FMLA or the Family Medical Leave Act and really help to protect her job long term. All of those individuals working together are able to work at the top of their skill sets, or as we like to say, at the top of their licenses to really meet the capacity to help this family of four address the health harming legal needs of this mom who's undergoing cancer treatment. By the way, many of the hypotheticals that we use um, do come from real stories. Um, and so you'll hear uh, Ann Mangimelli and Brad Meyer um, share some examples. Uh, we'll get into some of that even in the Q&A. Um, so around the country right now, uh, we have MLPs at over 400. We think we're probably closer to over 500 uh, sites around the country. And you can see based on the screen from the pie uh, chart uh, that there are over 160 HRSA funded health centers, but also look at that other number, the 40, right? Don't forget the FQHC lookalikes um, that I mentioned earlier, right? So we're also counting lookalikes. And then as you will hear from the Nebraska example, um, many of the MLPs engage in various uh, types of health organization partnerships. So those cross-sector partnerships, you may have a health center that uh, regularly works with the VA to identify veterans and make sure that uh, there's no wrongdoing for receiving services. What are the basic core components of an MLP? Uh, let's go to the next slide. We generally identify the following as the core components of, of a medical legal partnership. You've got your lawyer in residence. You got a formal agreement, uh, an MOU in, in place. You have some target population that you've identified. You're screening for their legal needs. You've designated resources to support your medical legal partnership. You've made some sort of changes or processes or agreements related to information sharing, including gathering consents. You're doing trainings on social determinants of health to increase uh, staff capacity to address those social needs. And then you are working to properly address legal staffing, not just with the lawyer, but in general. You may have CHWs, paralegals, and others who are engaged in your legal staffing. Those are the core components. For health center-based MLPs, on the next slide you'll see, I wanna highlight a couple of things here that um, a few years ago, the National Center for Medical Legal Partnership did take a bit of a more deep dive look into what makes up a health center-based MLP. What do they typically look like? So we found that health centers with MLPs tend to have larger staff. These tend to be the, ML, the excuse me, the health centers with the larger budgets. They tend to be in urban cities or in urban settings. And then they typically utilize um, pretty pretty advanced health IT networks. So I want to make a note. Today's webinar features panelists from Nebraska. I mentioned larger staff, larger budgets, large urban cities, and advanced health IT systems. Please, please, please keep that in mind. Um, Nebraska was invited for a very specific reason to share with you their experience. And so please uh, feel free, audience, to ask Ann and Brad questions about what they do look like in terms of the typical health center-based MLP and what distinctions may come up uh, from what we found is typical for health center-based MLPs. All right, so next slide. 
we're here to have a conversation about how you can start a strong MLP and sustain it, finding the funding for it. So in the Health Center MLP Toolkit, we lay out nine basic conversations that we believe every MLP, starting with a health center, but this is also, uh, we believe, transferable across different healthcare organizations. But what are some of those basic conversations that one should have when they're starting to lay the foundation for an MLP? Let's go to the next slide. You see the nine conversations laid out here on the screen. We've blurred out the ones we're not gonna directly address today because we're doing this webinar in a series. So for today, what we're gonna focus on both in my uh, overview here, as well as uh, Nebraska's presentation really is what are the SDOH problems or social determinants of health problems that you want to address? Um, this, this is a, a combined conversation that happens between the health partners and the legal partners. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that very briefly. How many lawyers do you need to identify or as, as, uh, for the need to accomplish your goal? Excuse me, how many lawyers do you need to identify as needed to uh, accomplish your goals? Um, then how do you build it? Direct services or are you contracting out? How, are you, how deeply are you integrating the legal services within your MLP? And then of course, while you all are here today, how do you pay for it? right and a part of that includes sustainability conversations from the start so first i want to make sure everyone knows on the next slide you don't need to address every single social uh determinant of health um social need for every single patient in your mlp this is really important to keep in mind when building a strong foundation don't bite off more than you can chew whether you are starting an mlp in general or you're evolving to add a new perhaps service or population to your MLP approach. Your model may very well decide that you are addressing all patients, but looking at specific social needs. You may also decide that you are addressing the needs of a subset of the patient population that you serve, but addressing all of their social needs, at least by screenings. And then finally, perhaps you are the health center-based MLP, where you and your legal partner have agreed that you're gonna look at all patients and all social needs. Great, <laughs> let us know how you fund that, because that is a very, very heavy lift. And it's not to say it can't be done, but those are some pretty, pretty heavy lifts and advanced MLPs and resources pouring into that. Next slide. How many lawyers do you need to meet the needs that you've identified and be able to accomplish your goals? I'm just gonna highlight that in the Health Center MLP Toolkit, what you'll find is that we have done an estimate of time involved for MLP services. So on this next slide, you'll see a table, as well as a chart that just outlines, you know, what are the types of activities and how many hours go into that, right? Because it's really hard to estimate budget-wise um, and capacity-wise, like, what it is that you'll need to dedicate if you don't even know like how many hours or who's needed and for what, right? So trust that the guidance we put in the toolkit did come from the field and these are averages and estimates. It all depends, however, on the types of uh, the model that you're carrying out. So as you'll see in the, the, uh, in the table or the graphic on the right-hand side of your screen, if you're maximizing legal representation of patients, doing 100 legal assessments and curbside consults and trainings and clinical level changes, you can see an average of the different types of touches that would occur. And of course, it goes all the way down if you are um, in that other model uh, at the bottom of the screen, model number three, where you're incorporating policy change, you may want to reduce the number of legal assessments, but increase, for example, the trainings to staff, the trainings or clinical level changes that can be made. You may want to increase also your curbside consult so you can pick up on hotspot for any sorts of needs that are happening community-wide that you can change through policy level activities. Next slide. How do you build it? Direct services or contracted out? In the toolkit, we go into a lot of detail with regard to um, how you do either approach. On the next slide, I'm just going to highlight that under the build it as a direct service model, this is where you're recruiting as an MLP. You are really deciding together with your uh, potential legal partner and you as a health center, you're really deciding how do you recruit and hire lawyers as employees of the health center. So there are some very, very fully integrated MLPs based at health centers. Whitman Walker is one example. We have examples at uh, Crescent Care down in Louisiana, um, and there are other examples around the country. 
There are other MLPs like who we've invited to speak today that contract legal services from a community-based legal services organization. In the MOU, that health center-based MLP is deciding what's the depth of expertise and capacity? What is the access to supervision, right? And then what are, what's the way that you're gonna be making the, the referrals, right? And then um, how can you then continue to share information uh, um, as, you, you are separate partners in this contracted model. Both work, both work. So next slide. How do you really make it work? You gotta pay for it. The big question always is how do you do this, right? So typically on the next um, slide, we'll see what a health center MLP budget looks like. You're thinking about staffing, right? These are the typical things your COOs, your CFOs, and, and CEOs always think about your program managers, right? Those who are writing the grant funds. They're also not forgetting the fact that there's travel time involved. There are promotional materials that need to be created, project management, right? Health informatics individuals who are gathering the data and analyzing it. Make sure you have that budget created before you dive into like searching for funding because you may have some serious gaps if you have not budgeted this thing out. Um, so what are the sorts of funds though that uh, health center-based MLPs have found? Let's go to the next slide. For health centers around the country, we found that uh, the typical funding stream on the health side and the legal side includes person enabling services funding. That's that 2014 change to the definition of enabling services to include uh, referrals to civil legal services uh, and screenings, of course. We've also seen um, some states, very few, this is still growing, uh, utilize Medicaid financing models through managed care to provide for the legal services uh, support of an MLP. We've also seen some state and local uh, public health funding uh, approaches, private uh, uh, investments, um, both on the legal side and on the healthcare side. Um, and then of course, we've seen some state administrators grants um, really help to support specific delivery of services, um, such as SAMHSA uh, block grants um, to address substance use disorder and mental health. And then we've seen states administer AmeriCorps legal assistance uh, programs. And of course, philanthropic investments. Philanthropic investments are often what help to start the MLP. So in the funding examples on the next slide, um, I won't walk through this, but it, I will point you all to the Health Center MLP Toolkit, where you will see three different examples uh, where health centers um, in year one will start off with different types of investment, philanthropic, a fellowship, right, opportunity such as Equal Justice Works, for example, and then to a federal grant, and then a split cost approach. That's a journey, right, to moving into year two, how to get and secure that funding and sustain it um, into year two and beyond. Take a look at the three funding examples in the Health Center MLP Toolkit, um, because it'll help you understand, I think, where you might be in this journey, and if you're right at the beginning, how you can start. It varies, it varies, it varies. Let's look at one of those variations. Going to stop here so that I can now transition so you can hear from one of those examples. I'm gonna pass the mic to Brad Meyer, CEO of Blue Stem Health. Brad, all yours. Hello, and uh, thanks for having me. Um, so I've been at Blue Stem Health since 2014. Um, and uh, I've done a lot of different things, paramedic, uh, um, and got started in clinic management um, about 20 years ago. Uh, so I've worked my way up through the ranks and have been uh, the CEO at a FQHC um, since 2014. So next slide. Um, so Blue Stem Health, uh, we were formerly called People's Health Center. Um, and then in 2018, we underwent uh, a name change and a rebrand because as an FQHC in Lincoln, Nebraska, Lincoln uh, has a population of around 280,000 people. Uh, we serve a population um, in the region of about 310, 320,000 people. Um, we've got between 20,000 and 21,000 patients. We have um, a large base in Lincoln that has a people's name. So like People City Mission, uh, Center for People in Need. And we were often confused with 
um, services that provide, you know, those ty that type of care for the uninsured uninsured, underserved populations. But we, as an organization, have kind of um, branched ourselves out a little bit differently. So we still are FQHC. We still primarily serve the medical, dental, and behavioral health services. But out of our 20,000 patients, only about 6,000 of them are on our sliding fee discount program. So we've actually grown by acquiring private practices um, and forming partnerships with other organizations. And so we changed our name in 2018 because we found um, that people referred to us as the Medicaid clinic or the poor people's clinic. And so a rebrand was needed so that the community can see all of the different things that we do for our patient population. Uh, about 60% of our patients are insured either through Medicaid, Medicare, or private insurance. So some of the things we provide is medical, dental, behavioral health. Um, we have chronic disease management. So we have uh, diabetic educators. We have three diabetic educators that see patients at no charge. Uh, we have chronic disease nurses that manage our complex patients and work with our uh, CCM um, partnerships to take better care of our patients. Uh, we have about 20 different programs uh, in our organization that provide care uh, for our patients. Uh, next slide. Um, so when I first started, we had one clinic, uh, which was the main clinic at 1021 North 27th Street. And since then, uh, we've grown our organization. Um, and we have five different clinic locations, one administration building, and we actually have clinics in um, two of our uh, largest health system um, buildings. So we have um, Bryan Health, which is one of the larger health systems in Lincoln. We have a clinic in each of their buildings because they have a need and we have a need to serve those populations that don't, have access or can't get access to affordable health care in other um, areas of town. So uh, we've been very fortunate there. Next slide. So one of the things that we do is we are really good at medical, providing medical and dental services. We've been around since 2003 um, and we've, we've gotten really good at medical and dental. Um, there are things that we have identified that we like partnering with, um, such as behavioral health, uh, the MLP program. We, as, as far as myself, I don't want to be an expert in everything. Uh, there's no possible way that we can know everything um, about everything. So we choose partnerships instead of bringing those services in-house directly. Uh, we started uh, formulating um, those partnerships back in 2015 um, with Lutheran Family Services doing behavioral health. Before that, we didn't do any behavioral health. Um, and we don't do your traditional 50-minute um, therapy sessions when I say behavioral health. We have an integrated care model where we put uh, behavioral health consultants, master's prepared therapists in the primary care setting. Um, it's one of those things that uh, we feel like the behavioral health uh, therapists can do a lot more triage when they have those warm handoffs. And they are the experts in identifying patients who have some type of behavioral health or mental health disorder. And so uh, that has been a very positive part of our patient base. Um, as a lot of you know, behavioral health is, uh, can be a tough cookie. It's uh, not always the most um, positive revenue generator, um, but with our contracts, with our partnerships with Lutheran Family Services, they are able to give us um, a lot more services than just the primary care 
um, integration piece. They have family therapists, they have uh, uh, child intensive therapy. And so that partnership that we have with them really works out well because they can do a lot more things than we would ever um, be able to do on our own. And so that's why our organization has chosen to do partnerships. Um, another reason we decided to partner with Legal Aid of Nebraska is because they have, not only do we get the MLP piece, but they have attorneys that specialize in many other services. And so if we were to bring that in-house, we would still only be able to focus on that MLP piece because I'm not an expert and I don't wanna be an expert in other law cases. So having that partnership with MLP, um, again, opens our patient population up to uh, a much broader scope than we would have uh, otherwise. Um, one of the things that's been really beneficial for us is the 340B pharmacies. Uh, when I first started, we had, um, you know, just a couple of pharmacies that we worked with. Um, we've been able to expand that to uh, other areas of Lincoln so that all of our patients now have um, the opportunity to get discounted medications through our 340B pharmacy. Two of our larger clinics have uh, a pharmacy in-house uh, and we uh, partner with Genoa Healthcare uh, to do that, but we also have independents, we have Walgreens, we have Walmart. And so all of our patients um, have access to a pharmacy that is very close to them. Next. And so some things about us. So when I first started, we had about 9,300 uh, patients. Um, this year, looking at our UDS for 2021, we'll have around 20 to 21,000. Um, we started 83 FTEs. Now we're over um, 166, closer to 170. Um, we partnered with medical uh, with Legal Aid in Nebraska back in 2015, I believe. And does that sound about right? I think it was 2016. I was just looking. 2016. <laughs> Um, so we were still, we weren't as big as we are now, but um, Anne will talk a little bit about how that partnership started. Um, it was through a, a grant and um, we definitely saw the value that it added to our patients. Um, again, we have three certified diabetic educators. Um, they see patients at no charge. Um, that has been extremely helpful. Our whole purpose is to provide holistic care to our patients. So with our chronic disease, with our 340B, with our MLP, uh, with our behavior health partnerships, we partner with our medical society on our uninsured specialty care. Um, our patients can get access to pretty much anything they need within our um, organization and our city. So anytime we identify that there's a need in our patient population, we look to figure out how we can decrease that barrier. And uh, that is the whole purpose. We have a paramedic, a community outreach coordinator. Her job is to liaison with the community. So she works with the hospital systems, uh, the discharge planners. Um, if we have a patient, let's say, uh, one of our doctors is laying up one night and says, you know, I haven't seen Sally Ann. Um, she's got bipolar. You know, I wonder what she's doing. We can send that paramedic out there to do a home visit. We don't charge for that service again. We don't bill for that service. Um, we don't bill for our diabetic educators either. Uh, and so that paramedic can go out there. She can have a 20, 30, 40 minute conversation and report back to the doctor saying, you know, Sally Ann's doing good. She's got uh, good uh, fruits and vegetables. She looks like she's taking care of herself. Or she can report back that, you know, Sally Ann answered the door with a tinfoil hat and all of her windows are boarded over. Um, so that helps the provider understand that maybe we need to get this patient in a little bit sooner. And so um, that's been very instrumental and it's made us one of the um, 
you know, that's kind of been the highlight of the hospitals and why they refer patients to us is because of the services that we add. Uh, in July 2020, hopefully, barring any more COVID uh, supply issues, uh, we will have a primary care and mobile clinic. Um, this mobile clinic will be a 37-foot RV um, style clinic. It's going to have the same capabilities as uh, any of our primary care offices. And we'll be able to take that around the region and to places of Lincoln that we don't have a presence right now. Uh, right now, there's there's none in Lincoln, so we'll have the very first one. And all of these things and changes that we've made have shown up. You may not be able to quantify it directly, but you've got to know that having behavioral health integration in the primary care setting is beneficial. Uh, even though we may not be able to quantify that, we've got, we know it's the right thing to do. And our UDS, when I first started, uh, we were in the thousands <laughs> um, out of all the FQHCs. And so we were, we were ranked at you know, anywhere between 800 and 1,000. Um, last year's rankings in 2020, uh, we were ranked number 36 out of all the FQHCs in the United States uh, for our health outcomes, for our UDS numbers. And so that is just, um, it's a tremendous opportunity to show what our staff is capable of doing and really shows that our staff really love our patient base and we will do whatever it takes to make our patients the healthiest that they can be. Um, and with that comes, you know, top tier contracts with ACOs and um, our Medicaid and Medicare managed care programs. If you do not provide good quality for your patients, um, you're not going to be able to seek out those, those top tier um, value based contracts that everybody's going for. Um, and so we are in the top tier. Um, for all of our ACO in the top five, if not the top one or two um, in all of our contracts. Uh, next slide. And so that's all I have, and I'll let Andy take or Anne take over. Um, so you can go to my first slide. So I'll tell you a little bit about Legal Aid of Nebraska in general. Um, legal Aid is a statewide civil legal services. We have offices in six different cities in the state of Nebraska. Um, Omaha is on the Iowa border. And then the furthest office from us is Scotts Bluff, which is um, on the Colorado border. So it's about a six hour drive from our office to the furthest office that Legal Aid has. Um, and I don't even know how old Legal Aid is. <laughs> I know that I've been here a long time. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about our medical legal partnership in, in general, and then I'll talk a little bit about what we do with, with BlueStem. So I was trying to figure out how to explain who we are and what we do. We have seven hospital systems and 15 hospitals. And what I mean by that is, uh, for instance, probably the easiest one to talk about is um, CHI Health. CHI Health is one hospital system, but they have six hospitals that we are involved in. So they actually have four hospitals in Omaha alone. They used to have five, but one of them merged with another hospital. So we're in all four of their hospitals here in Omaha. They have a hospital in Lincoln, Nebraska, which we are involved in, Grand Island and Kearney. So they are a hospital system, but we actually serve six of their hospitals. So we're in a lot of hospitals, seven different hospital systems but overall, some of those hospital systems have more than one hospital. Brad mentioned um, Bryan Hospital in Lincoln. They have two hospitals in Lincoln. We serve both of those hospitals. We have on-site and on-site attorney that serve both of those hospitals. So when I'm talking about hospitals and hospital systems, that's what I mean. So we're in 15 different hospitals, two federally qualified health centers, and then we actually have a contract with Lutheran Family Services. Lutheran Family Services is not either a hospital or a federally qualified health center, um, but they provide behavioral health and we have a contract with them. So I didn't include them in these numbers, um, but we do have a contract with them to provide services for their patients as well. 
So we are in a total of five different cities in Nebraska. I mentioned the ones that CHI Health are in, so Omaha, Lincoln, Grand Island, Kearney, but we also have a contract with Columbus Community Hospital, which is in Columbus, Nebraska, which has a population of about 30,000 people. So that is probably the smallest town that we are in um, providing services with that hospital. And that hospital actually gives us an awful lot of, of referrals just for being in such a small town. Uh, next slide, please. So what's our journey? How did, how did we get here? The, the Nebraska Medical Legal Partnership um, started in 2009. We had a $25,000 budget and it was just me. Um, Nebraska Medicine, Dr. Carrie Rodebaugh came into town and she had had a medical legal partnership in Buffalo, New York. And so as part of her contract with Nebraska Medicine, when she decided to go there, she said, I'll go, but I want you to do this little pilot project with Legal Aid of Nebraska, where you give them 25 grand a year and we'll see how it goes. Um, so here we are, we went from 2009 to where we are in 2022 and HELP's budget is approximately $1.4 million. So you can do the math, I can't, that's why I went to law school, um, of how much we have increased. We've grown about one hospital per year since 2013. Our budget grew a little bit with Nebraska Medicine from 2009 to 2013. We went to um, CHI, one of their hospitals, Emanuel Medical Center, reached out to us in 2013. They actually had a medical legal partnership in Iowa and heard that we had one in Nebraska and they reached out to us and said, um, hey, you know, would you consider doing what you're doing with Nebraska Medicine with us? So we contracted with them. A year later, I approached our then executive director and said, can we please expand to it was another CHI hospital who had a very large poverty population. And I asked if we could expand to that hospital, if we could ask their CFO if we could expand. Um, in a five minute conversation, I remember holding my lunch in my hand. We had him on the phone and he said, is there a reason you can't do all of the CHI hospitals? At that point, they had a different name. They've changed names like three times. Um, but he says, is there a reason you can't do all of our hospitals in Omaha? So within five minutes, we went from thinking we were going to expand to one hospital to expanding to, at the time, um, four more in the city of Omaha. So that was a huge jump in 2000. That was 2014. 2015, we expanded um, to two of our other hospitals, Methodist Health System and Children's Hospital. I typically only want to expand one hospital per year. At that point, we had reached out to Methodist Hospital and asked if we could have a meeting with them. Children's Hospital actually approached us. They determined on their own that they had patients who had medical needs and they found us on the National Center for Medical Legal Partnership website and reached out to me. And so we ended up starting two new hospitals on the exact same day in 2015. The reason I know, Brad, that it was 2016 that we went to Bluestem was because we had written a grant for Community Health Endowment in Lincoln, who eventually ended up funding us. Um, at the time, what was People's Health Center and Lutheran Family Services had a really great um, FQHC that's called Health 360. And they had all of their behavioral health, their healthcare, pharmacy, they had all these great services in that building. And we had done a grant with Community Health Endowment to try to put our medical legal partnership there. We got turned down on that grant. We happened to be doing a screening of something the next year, and I ran into one of the individuals that's on Community Health Endowment Board, and I started talking to him. And she said, we don't get what you do. We don't understand what medical legal partnerships are. So I talked to her for about 20 minutes and explained who we are and what we do and why our services don't, other lap, don't overlap other individuals in the community. We wrote our grant in 2016. We got a three-year grant with Community Health Endowment, which is what got us into working with what was then People's Health Center and then Blue Stem. So 2016, we were able to expand to Blue Stem um, Health, doing just services at Health 360. In 2017, um, this is my favorite story ever. I asked my executive director whether I could send an email to uh, the then director, the then CEO of Bryan Health Center, or Bryan Health, which is in Lincoln. And he said, sure. And I emailed that person on a weekend, and the next morning she actually called me. 
And so we were able to expand into Blue or into Brian Health in 2017. Um, I've kind of lost track of where we've gone after that because it's kind of exploded. Um, last year, we got a grant to expand into the VA hospital. We were one. Um, we were one of two grants that were provided by an organization. It was called um, Women Investing in Nebraska. We started out with 84 grant applications, and it got down to uh, our organization and another. So they have, for one year, funded us to provide services at the VA. So my staff has gone from, over this period of time, my staff has gone from just me and part of me um, doing the education, the on-site time, and um, you know, trying to raise funds, to I now have a staff of seven full-time attorneys, including myself, four full-time paralegals, and two full-time patient advocates. The patient advocates do um, all of our administrative, or a lot of our administrative stuff. So um, SNAP denials, Medicaid denials, Social Security disability denials. And we do, I think our, our numbers for last year were about 2,200 cases were what we handled through um, the MLP. Um, so before I before I go to the next slide, let me talk about Blue Stem Health a tiny bit more. So our, our funding with Blue Stem Health, um, that CHE grant ended after three years. And at that time, we couldn't find anyone else that was going to refund that relationship. At the time, Blue Stem was rebranding, exploding, and um, growing a great deal. So I think we went about a year where we weren't in Blue Stem providing any further services. And after about a year, Brad reached out to me and said, we're writing this grant. Um, can you give us some language? We would like to write you into this grant. And I said, sure. And I provided him some language. And then I don't know how many months it was later, Brad, where he contacted me and said, um, hey, we got the grant. You know, you're coming back and you're going to provide services. And so that grant has continued to provide us, and they have graciously written us in continually to that grant um, to be able to continue to provide services. So we not only provide services at that original location, but we provide services to all of their locations. We are on site at two of their largest locations. I have an attorney uh, who's not only now on their board of directors, he's become so involved with the work that he does at Blue Stem but he also is on site at two of those facilities every Thursday, even through COVID. I think through a large part of COVID, he was going on site continually um, to provide services to those patients. So yeah, we've yeah. been very lucky. Go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, so that first grant, um, it was kind of a shot in the dark because it was a behavioral health SUDS grant. So it was substance abuse uh, grant and I knew that we had patients who were suffering from substance abuse issues. Um, a lot of our patients have uh, problems in the court system. And so a lot of the patients um, that we had with substance abuse issues do not seek out um, opportunities to better themselves because of their past history. And so when we looked at this behavioral health grant, we looked at it and said, okay, what's the biggest detriment or what's the biggest reason that our patients don't look out for themselves? And a lot of the times it was, you know, they've got traffic offenses or they've got court offenses that they've never taken care of. And so they just try to lay low and they never fix that problem. And so when you work with other um, entities like we do and we've identified patients that, um, you know, are not doing the best they can be because of their fears of, you know, getting caught up in the legal system. It just made perfect sense to partner with Legal Aid of Nebraska to help get them out of their current situation. You know, at that time, the drug court in Lincoln was becoming a huge deal, and we were able to help many of our patients get rid of or satisfy a lot of their charges. And that made them feel better and allowed them to focus more on their health. And it created a lot more opportunities for them. And so it's as an FQHC, 
there are grants out there. There are, um, you know, the MCOs, uh, the man managed care organizations want to fund these types of projects. It's just thinking, how can this benefit my patients? How can our patients, what are the obstacles? And then find those opportunities. And it's just being creative. And you could pretty much make any anything work or any, um, you know, grant work towards an MLP project. So sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I- No, I, I appreciated you giving your insight on that. Um, so next slide. So this is how our MLP is funded. We have 55% hospital funded contracts where the hospitals pay us directly to do work for their patients. 19% are grants. And those are not grants that are funding hospital projects, but are except for the, the VA. Um, they are ones that are funding, for instance, we have a grant that funds us to work with individuals who have developmental or intellectual disabilities. And that's a hotline that we have that families can call if they live in um, Douglas or Sarpy counties in Nebraska, in Nebraska, where we can provide services under that grant. And then we have 26% subgrantees, and that's what I consider us at Blue Stem. We're a subgrantee. We also have that same arrangement with Charles Drew, um, which is a federally qualified health center in Omaha. And we have that same agreement with Blue Stem Family Services on a very specific project that we are working with with them. Okay, so next slide. So these are some of my some of my takeaways. This is what I've learned over the years of doing this. Um, if anybody's ever heard me speak anywhere, you're going to hear me talk about the fluffy puppy and the bar graph. And that is know your audience. Who are you talking to if you're an attorney and you're trying to set up one of these medical legal partnerships? Who are you talking to at the hospital? Um, you know, the bar graph, the CEOs, for the most part, are going to want to know what is the bar graph? Why does this, why does this matter to me? And in that, you're going to watch your data. And the ACA community benefit. So when the Affordable Care Act went into law, part of that requires each hospital who's going to be a nonprofit to do a certain amount of community benefit. And they have to do this three-year plan. Every three years, they have to say, how are we going to benefit the community? They can actually use what they pay you as an MLP as part of that community benefit. So you're not only helping their patients, but they can take you somewhat as a deduction to keep their nonprofit status. A lot of hospitals don't know that. So knowing your, what you're selling, saying this is not only bar graph wise, are we saying you can be part of, you know, we can be part of a community benefit, but we can keep your patients from being readmitted. When you talk about bundling services and, you know, patients that are readmits because something in the community, a social determinant that the hospital has no control over is bringing this patient back and back and back again to the emergency department. And at some point, that is not going to be paid for under bundled services. So being able to explain why it is, why does it matter to the hospital's bottom line that you're doing this work, but also being able to say the fluffy puppy. So the good stories, why, you know, there, there was an individual at Nebraska Medicine and when we first started doing this, she wasn't 100% bought in and she'll tell you that she wasn't 100% bought in. But she said it was really over the years, and she's a finance person, but she said over the years, it was really the fluffy puppy stories, the stories that didn't make any difference with regard to the bottom line of the hospital. Those were the ones who, those were the stories that drew her in and let her know, okay, you know, this, this is worthwhile. We should be doing this for our patients. So it really is a combination of both. It's funny, whenever I talk to somebody that is the administrative level of hospitals, and they will tell me, um, you know, I'm not sure we're going to have that many referrals. And then we talk to the social workers and care managers, and their brains just light up. And they're like, we could refer you this, and we could refer you. So it, it really, depending upon who you're talking to, if you get those social workers involved and you get the finance people involved, between the two of them, um, you know, you can really sell why it's worthwhile going into the hospital. But you need to know what you're talking about. You can't just go into a hospital and say, we're going to do good work for your patients. They want to do good work for the patients, but hospitals only have a certain amount of money to spend. So you have to give them a valid business reason why you should be doing that work. Uh, one case I do want to tell you about. So we had a patient. Um, we had a patient who was what I call a super utilizer of the emergency department of one of our hospitals, meaning 
that she had been in the hospital, in the emergency department, and then um, admitted unpaid three times during one year period of time because she had high blood pressure crisis because she couldn't afford her high blood pressure medication. I did not know that high blood pressure crisis was a thing until I got this patient. I got her because she needed to be on social security disability, not for the high blood pressure, but because she had other things that were going on and she kept getting turned down. I got her benefits. I got her social security disability benefits, which got her some income, which allowed her to pay for her medication, which wasn't covered for some reason under something else. And no more admits over the, over that, you know, next year that we followed her. So it's a huge thing because, you know, that's three hospital admissions that weren't paid for that now went to no hospital admissions. And when you're able to talk about things like that, that is one of the things that catches a hospital's attention. Um, social workers, case managers, they are key. They are the ones that are going to refer you those cases. They are the ones that have the time with the patients to be able to determine whether they have a legal need. We occasionally get ones from doctors. I will say what I really like about the FQHCs and when we're in small clinics, we get more referrals from doctors there because a lot of them don't have a lot of social workers, but it's there's such a small environment that they get to know our folks. They understand who our folks are. And they are more likely, I always call it muscle memory. When we have our attorney on site, it's the muscle memory of the people within the FQHC and within the hospital seeing them and saying, oh yeah, I forgot that you are here and that you do this. But in large hospital settings, it is your social workers and case managers that are gonna be your key to getting those referrals and making them successful. The next one is know your worth. Don't go into a hospital and do the work for free. That, you, know, you can do it as part of a grant, um, but get hospital buy-in at some point, because if you don't, they're never going to pay you. It's very difficult once you go in and you're doing the work for free to then come back and say, by the way, now I'd like you to, to pay me for doing this. So know your worth, know that it's worth them paying you to do this work. Sustainability requires constant work education and outreach. You are constantly, the social worker turnover is huge in hospitals, especially right now. They move from hospital to hospital. The reason our VA hospital was such a success going, you know, right from the start was every single social worker that's at the VA hospital now in Omaha worked at one of my other hospitals. So the minute our doors opened for them, it was, you know, flocking. But there's new social workers that are coming in. There are new individuals at the hospital that don't know who you are. So it is a constant attending huddle meetings, um, attending staff meetings, doing outreach, doing education. Um, I'm speaking to social workers tomorrow. I give free CEUs all the time at my hospital. I'm doing a CEU tomorrow on hospital policies that came out as a result of COVID telehealth and why telehealth is not great for poor people, people with disabilities, people who don't, um, English is not their first language. So four times a year at one of our hospitals, we do free CEUs, but I do them at other hospitals as well. It's a service that I can do for the social workers and the nurses and the doctors, but it also gets me in front of them so that they know who I am. Um, joint applications carry more weight. If you can either be a sub-grantee or go in on an application with one of the health centers or one of the hospitals that you're trying to work with, that looks really great to people who want to fund you because they're getting more bang for their buck. They're being able to um, get two organizations for one. So if you can work with your healthcare facility and say, look, we have the grant, or can we work with your grant person to try to get us um, some money, we can be written in, we can provide you the language, then that goes a long way in being more successful in getting your grants. Next slide, please. So the changes in the HRSA funding that allowed MLP to be funded, that was a game changer because it allows us to be considered and funded under some of the FQHCs. Watch some of the bills that are coming through that would allow for VA funded MLPs. Um, we've been contacted by a couple of organizations that because of some of the bills that have passed now want to pay us to provide services to their veteran patients. So watch some of those bills that are coming through to see if that gets expanded so that we are able to provide services in the VA and the VA will be able to help us fund that project. Um, I, I quote public law um, 
116-315 that was actually sent to me by my contact at our VA hospital that said, look at this, you know, we're hoping that this is something we can use to fund you down the road. One of the great things that I have, especially with, with some of my hospitals, but especially with my FQHCs, is they're used to fundraising. So they become very um, good at pointing things out of, hey, could we write this one together? And really working with me to try to find funding to continuously do what we're doing. Um, considerations for policies that would recognize MLP services as a necessary continuation of care. Something, you know, policies that would recognize that we should be paid for under Medicaid and Medicare as a continuation of the hospital service. That to recognize that MLPs really do directly affect the health of patients. That's nothing I can do because I can't lobby. But down the road, something that if we were talking about how can MLPs be sustainable? Um, there should be some sort of policy that would build us in that we could be billed for, you know, that we could bill under Medicaid or Medicare or insurance as a continuation of services. So that is all I have um, on my end of things. Thank you, and thank you, Brad. Um, much more to come, right? You all continue to evolve. And so what we'd like to do here in the Q&A, I just want to remind the audience, um, as Danielle's been doing a wonderful job in the chat, just letting folks know, number one, this is a 90-minute webinar today, so we're going for about 25 more minutes here to really go into some questions that both came in in advance and came in during the webinar itself. Um, so let's go to the next slide just to get some of those questions up on the screen and then I will pivot to our other colleague here at the National Center, Catherine Stinton, uh, to cue her up to read some of the questions that came in from the live audience. Um, I'll also note just as a reminder here since we um, are on the tail end here of the webinar that um, the, this is being recorded, so in case you do need to go, uh, we'll make sure you get the recording number two. This webinar is based on our Health Center MLP Toolkit, and you will see the Health Center MLP Toolkit PDF uploaded as a handout to uh, the, the webinar uh, platform, but it's also available on our website, and you'll also, that's also where you'll be able to easily find the brief on financing MLPs. All right, so um, this first question um, on the screen, let me pose to Brad. Um, Brad, for health centers, you know, right now still uh, going through um, helping patients with COVID and all of the stemming issues uh, that are social in nature um, uh, related to COVID or because of COVID. How have you as a health center with an MLP um, and a growing health center identified and prioritize some of those social legal challenges for your patient population? Has anything changed as a result of the pandemic? So one of the things that as an organization, we have the mentality of we refer anybody and everybody to the MLP program. It doesn't matter if they have social economic issues. It doesn't matter if we think it's not a legal issue per se. Um, anybody that we identify has a need, we refer. If it if if it's to legal aid, um, we refer them, and then their attorneys figure out whether or not they can help them. And if they can't, they refer them somewhere else. So it, it's kind of um, you know how do you identify and prioritize? We identify anybody with a need. It doesn't matter if they have, if, if they're a doctor. I mean, we have doctors that come to our clinics because we're in mm -hmm. the hospital systems. It doesn't matter if they're a doctor. It doesn't matter if they're homeless. Everybody that has a need, we will refer and we'll let the MLP program figure out whether they can help them or whether they can partner them out to um, other entities. And so that really takes all the guesswork out of it and makes it very easy for our staff. Mm -hmm. Super helpful, thank you. And I'm gonna to transition to Catherine to pose a question for you and Brad um, about uh, really like, you know, since you're addressing all social needs being referred to you. Um, question, there's a, uh, Catherine, there's a question for Brad. Do you wanna go ahead and read that out um, and pose it to Anne and Brad, please? Okay, so we have, um, I think it was more directly for Brad, but if Anne could answer as well, 
Um, this audience member is an FQHC with a similar patient population size to blue stems. And they were just wondering if you could share a little bit about the budget range to start uh, to introduce an MLP to um, an FQHC. Yeah, so what we did is we wrote a one FTE um, into the original grant. And so I just reached out to Ann and said, what does it cost to have a one FTE um, attorney handle it? We talked about our caseload, whether a one FTE was too much, too little, um, but we started out with um, a one FTE. Um, and so I'm not going to I'm not going to give any proprietary information or um, anything out, but I really worked with the MLP and said, let's start with a 1.0 FTE and let's write that into the budget. If we don't make, uh, if we don't get that much, we'll talk about what our, our options are. Um, but I wanted to start big and that's kind of what we um, went off of and how we came up with the initial budget number. And if I can jump in on the um, on the FTE part of things. So what I've done over the years is I've kind of gotten down to what is it that one of my attorneys can handle as a case for a client base for one year? How many cases can one attorney handle? Um, and when I say that I have an attorney that's on site with Blue Stem, he's our attorney that's on site at Blue Stem. He doesn't take all the cases that come from Blue Stem. I parcel them out you know, among my attorneys so that everybody kind of has the same sort of caseload. But I have come down to what I think is um, how many cases an attorney can handle. When I do that, I take into account that some cases are going to be advice and counsel only, some are going to be brief service, some are going to be extended representation. And once I got to this is how many cases I think an attorney can do, then I shoot it to my finance person and say, okay, what does an attorney cost. And an attorney cost means not just that attorney salary. It means what is the overhead? Um, what are the benefits? What are all of, you know, if you're going to, we always throw it into the bin and what shoots out. So what is an attorney cost? I get that from my finance person. And then that is what we fund. So the way that I write our contracts is to say that we will do this many cases a year for this amount of money. I'm very careful to say cases, not people. Because if you say I will serve this many patients, you know, it is sure that, so say I say I'm going to serve 50 patients, um, and I, it's more than that, but say I'm going to serve 50 patients, you can guarantee that at least half of those patients have two to three other needs. So you really undersell yourself if you say, if you do it on patients, because you'll end up serving 200 cases for just 50 people. So I always do it on, we will do this number of cases rather than this number of patients. But that's how we that's how we come to those agreements. And I've actually gotten really good at figuring out how many cases an attorney can do per year. It's a great, great, great distinction for those who are brand new at MLP and those who are evolving to expand into new services or address other populations within the community um, as emerging needs rise. Um, let's see, Catherine, there's another question uh, that came in from the audience, um, and it's in two parts. So Anne and Brad, there are quite a number of folks interested in leveraging Medicaid financing um, or funding streams, uh, whether it's through managed care or otherwise, to really address the social determinants of health. Catherine, I'm just going to ask you to ask out loud those two questions uh, that came in from the audience, please. Of course, they're kind of multi-part here. So the first one is, you know, can you speak more about Medicaid funding of MLPs and what do MCOs see as their return on this investment? Um, and are there specific um, social determinants of health that they could target that would be more likely um, for the MCO to consider funding the MLP? Um, yeah, I can start. So we have talked with our, uh, so in Nebraska, we've got three Medicaid managed care programs. Um, two of them are easy to work with. One won't even pick up a, the phone. Um, I don't even know who their leadership is, to be honest. Uh, but the other two are really good to work with. And so um, they are wanting FQHCs to be successful. 
And they have, if you've never built up a relationship with your MCOs, you have to do that because they've got money that you have no idea is available to you. And so um, we've had other projects that, you know, it's not just um, the Medicaid population, but if we have a project such as MLP, which I've talked to them in the past about, they find a reason to fund it. If they can make it work for their population, one of the things in Nebraska is that they are entitled to uh, 1% profit on their uh, Medicaid managed care uh, patients. And so if they, if they take that 1% and if they go over, they've got to send that money back to the state. If they do, it looks bad because it goes in the papers. They're saying, oh, blank, blank and blank gave back $40 million because they couldn't spend it. When the FQHCs, when other Medicaid providers could use those monies to help their patients and help our patients. And so don't be afraid to ask the Medicaid managed care programs for projects. Um, most likely, if they value your relationship, if they value your uh, your partnership, they will figure out a way to fund you. You know, in, in Nebraska and and I would say probably in other states, but you'd have to look at what the managed care for states that have a managed care organizations that are doing their Medicaid. In Nebraska specifically, it is built into their contracts with the state that they have to address social determinants of health. So I would, in whatever state you are in, look to see, is that part of their contract? If their contract with the state says they have to address social determinants, how are they doing that? And can you sell your services to say, hey, we can help you with that. We can help you address what's required in, in the contract. And Brad, I know they're all up for new contract renewals this year. So maybe that one who's not very helpful will get ousted. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, and thank you, Brad. Um, so I'm going to ask one of the questions on the screen. Um, more about the the uh, mechanics, the ethics, right? Um, what are some best practices? Uh, perhaps there's an example, right, to help illustrate this for managing conflicts of interest, and they can come up either with patients, with staff, with the community. Um, so I know conflicts of interest come up in various ways. I'm going to speak very broadly here and ask you all to um, maybe share uh, some tips for those of the folks in the audience who uh, need some help managing conflicts of interest as they arise. I'm not really sure in what in what tense this conflict is, um, is being asked. Um, yeah, so, so in Go yeah, ahead, I can, yeah, we can um, help use the next question to, to add some context. So, for example, in the next question on the screen, um, one of our uh, registrants did ask, how are, you know, folks distinguishing uh, between the MLP's uh, legal staff and then general counsel? So if there's a conflict of interest arising in that context, right, while you're managing referrals to the lawyers, how do you ensure, what practices do you engage in to ensure that in that referral context, staff at, let's see, say the health center or even a hospital understand the difference between legal counsel for the hospital and then your MLP attorneys? And that is also an ongoing process. Um, so I will, so one of the hospitals, um, the attorney, one of the, the head social workers calls me and she's laughing and she says, in-house counsel wants to know why all these social workers keep calling and asking them questions. Well, the reason was because they would call and ask me a question and I would say that's in-house counsel question. It's a hospital question. How does the hospital handle this issue? So um, I do have a pretty good relationship with in-house counsel at several of the hospitals. They'll call me to ask questions about things that are within my realm. Um, I will, you know, talk to them about things that are definitely a hospital issue. I'll give an opinion on things, but tell social workers this is a hospital um, question. It is not a me question. It's not a patient question. We always, as far as the patients are concerned, we explain to them that we do not represent the hospital. We are not employed by the hospital. We don't get paid by the hospital as an employee. We are an independent contractor. 
So even if the hospital wants us to do something, say wants us to pursue a course of action that the client doesn't want us to pursue, we don't pursue it because we tell the client we represent them and we tell the hospital the same thing. But it also is an ongoing conversation with social workers um, that, you know, what is a hospital question? Sometimes they'll call us because I think we answer faster than in-house counsel, but you know, I don't want to step on any toes. So it is always, if it's an ethical question of, you know, can a patient do this? I will say that's a hospital question. It's a hospital question on whether you can let somebody, um, I'll give you an example. In Nebraska, we have a surrogate decision-making act, which allows for if somebody doesn't have a guardian or a healthcare power of attorney, it allows for a hierarchy of individuals that can make decisions if the, per, if the patient lacks capacity. Every single one of those times, I will tell the social worker, this is my reading of the statute, but I don't know how your hospital attorney interprets that or your ethicists or whatever. So in this particular case, you're going to have to ask them whether you should allow this relative to be making these decisions. So that's how I go mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's one of the beauties about partnerships. And that's one of the reasons I like partnerships. If you have behavioral health in in-house or if you have other things in-house you know in an fqhc if you send more let's say insured patients you know that could look like you're serving more insured than the uninsured and so you've got to kind of justify why are not why are there not enough underserved or uninsured people being referred to this process partnerships they you just refer as part of your regular process and then it's that organization who takes care of the rest of the responsibility you've done your part it's easy for us because we make you know in our organization we have several hundred referrals a day probably you know to especially specialties to community resources and stuff like that so it's part of our EHR process. We can track that. We can see who's better at responding. Um, and we can get those notes back as, as needed. So conflict of interest um, is pretty cut and dry when you have partnerships like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, agreed. A lot easier to manage with a partnership in place. Um, I'm going to go to a question. And Catherine, I'm getting a lot of questions from the audience. I'm gonna like take liberty to read this one out uh, to Anne and Brad. Um, so Anne and Brad, uh, some folks in the audience are curious um, as to whether you have some suggestions for a new MLP that wants to focus on helping children um, who need medical and legal services. So any recommendations for folks working uh, through their MLP to address the needs of children specifically, such as partnering with children's hospitals or connecting with community clinics that, um, that are able to help identify and address the needs of children in their patient population? If you have a children's hospital, um, that is the best place to start. Um, we have Children's Hospital Medical Center here in Omaha. And as I said when I was talking earlier, they actually reached out to us um, and noticed that they have patients who have legal issues and it wasn't just the patients, but the, the parents, you know, the parents possibly have FMLA, lots of FMLA questions um, while their children are being treated. But we do a lot of children's um, SSI, so disability. We also do a lot of guardianships as children are aging out and they may have um, children who don't have capacity, but they're hitting the age of majority and we need to do adult disabled children guardianships. So my suggestion would be to look at the kinds of issues that you foresee children having and then approach the hospital about starting a partnership to address, you know, rather than going to the hospital and saying, what kind of issues are you seeing? They're not going to know. Go to the hospital and say, these are the kinds of issues that we have seen the children have, and this is why they need to be addressed, because you've got families who are dealing a lot of times we end up doing guardianships for, um, you know, grandma and grandpa are bringing the kid in because mom and dad have, have gone away. You know, they just have disappeared. And so legally, at least in Nebraska, they don't have the right to make medical decisions, getting the kid in school, getting the kid immunized. So I would say go to the hospital 
with um, what you see those legal issues be. The other place that I would look at if you don't have a children's hospital is possibly looking at juvenile court. You know, here in Nebraska, we're starting to address what kinds of legal needs are getting people into the juvenile system in the first place. Is there, is there a way to fund, you know, the state here is looking at funding voluntary services that occur before a family becomes involved in juvenile court, and those would be civil legal services. So that's another sort of funding to look at if you're not looking at going into a children's hospital. That's great. Brad, if I could um, use that example or, you know, build on um, what you explained about uh, the behavioral health um, integration or substance use disorder, I guess maybe it was just the expansion grants that you received to help start your MLP work. Are there any specific funders that you might like recommend um, folks look to for funding their MLP work, whether it's private or public funds, um, especially if they're piloting an MLP for children or for veterans, we know opportunities are forthcoming. Um, any suggestions? I think, um, you know, we, we've talked about, you know, writing um, a HRSA grant for school-based clinics. Right now we don't do any school-based clinics. Having an MLP partnership will help so much in that work, right? Because there's so many different issues that happen. Um, you know, I, I would say be creative when you're writing grants. We don't write a whole lot of grants. We uh, we get about $2 million a year in our 330 grants and other grants uh, between federal and state. We had a $21 million budget and only 2 million are, are grants. The other is page, patient service revenue. And so when we write grants, we don't chase every $10,000 or $15,000 grants. We write grants that we're going to be able to sustain as an organization. Nothing frustrates staff more than writing a one-year grant that you can no longer sustain. Mm -hmm. And so all of our grants, we, we're a little bit different and we identify, are we going to be able to sustain this after the initial project grant? And so I would write them into any grant that you're going after. That's great. And I'm going to pose to you, I think, um, hopefully, a <laughs> it's going to be two parts, and I can't lie to you, I'm trying to essentially get to the question on the screen, right, about the limitations of the EHR, EMR data sharing, right? So if there is an MLP with um, a barrier to sharing information because third-party access isn't allowed into the EMR, have you found some solutions that are workable here for the screenings or referrals? And then this was the second part, and the outcome. So maybe you and Brad can uh, make note about, you know, how are, are you crafting metrics um, and what kind of data are you sharing to, to guide uh, those metrics um, and, and allowing you to know whether or not you're meeting your outcomes? I have not found not being in the EHR. I know I'm probably going to get in trouble for this because everybody wants to be in the EHR. I haven't found that to be a big, a big barrier. Um, you know, the way that referrals come over to us, the patient has signed a release so that the hospital can share information with us. We then have the patient or client sign um, a release so that we can share basic information back with the hospital. Um, we do not violate the attorney-client privilege, but just the fact that we were able to help them. We are very lucky at Legal Aid in Nebraska to have a dedicated data person and our, um, our timekeeping system has so much stuff built into it that we can run reports. Um, you know, Kelly Shaw Sutherland is our data person. And from the first day that she came, she unfortunately came into our office after I was well established as an MLP. And the minute she sat down at her desk, I was in her office saying, so I want this sort of information. So we, we save so much information. I'm constantly asking her, can we do this or can we do that? Or how do we find this out? Um, so we have all sorts of data as far as demographics. We can find out how much money we get for a client's um, and Toto over the year and social security disability benefits. In one of our particular hospitals, we're able to show how many Medicaid dollars are paid to them every year. And that is with, we share with them what cases we've won 
they then have a person over on their end who runs how many Medicaid dollars they got back as a result of that. So each hospital is different. Some hospitals don't care about the particular data except for the number of cases and the outcomes. They don't care about money back to the hospital. So each hospital is different. Um, but I would say as far as you know, that information, try to figure out what the hospital wants, what do they have an interest in knowing, and then figure out a way in your, within your system to build that in so you can track it, and then find somebody over on their end who can give you the information that you need. Like I said, two of my hospitals are able to give me Medicaid dollars paid back. The other ones don't care. Um, but it's great when they do care that you can find somebody specifically to work with over on their end. And Brad, you're taking us home. How are you measuring the outcomes as a health center? <laughs> so, um, so it, unless it's a grant funded position, we don't care about numbers. I was, I was talking about our, you know, our diabetic educators and our paramedic. Um, we don't care. We can see their schedules. We don't care about their data. But with a grant funded position, you've got to have that data, right? And as FQHCs, we love uh -huh. data. Um, and so what I do is I just, when I talk to Ann about, I'm putting you in the budget, these are the types of things um, that we're going to talk about that we're going to request. And can you do it? And she'll say, yep, we can do that easily. No big deal. And so I don't, when I write the grant, I don't put things in that they're not going to be able to do because that just creates, you know, problems everywhere. Mm -hmm. So I try to keep it as generic and basic as possible um, just to fulfill the requirements of what I'm asking for in the grant. Makes perfect sense. Perfect sense. I want to thank you both for taking the questions and answers for the audience. We took a log of the questions that came in that we weren't able to answer. And so we'll be sure we uh, review them and see if we can get to it. Um, I'm just going to roll through some closing slides here and note that the slides, um, everyone's slides, Ann Mangiamelli, Brad Myers, our National Center slides will be posted on our website. So um, we do have some takeaways and tips built into our slides, such as uh, tips to consider um, how to assess social needs for patients, the factors that impact um, the MLP lawyer's capacity, funding an MLP, as well as the sustainability piece and program evaluation. Let's just go to the contact information slide and note that at the very bottom of the slide deck, this is definitely what we won't go through, but we want to make sure you know we'll be there. There are resources, the Health Center MLP Toolkit, the financing uh, issue brief, and of course, um, uh, we'll have some information on uh, data and statistics that you may want to rely upon that uh, was gathered by NAC on an annual basis. The National Association of Community Health Centers creates a chart book, um, and their 2021 chart book contains a lot of data, including on enabling services, but really about the health center patient population um, that uh, legal services may want to utilize in writing those grants, in designing the metrics, in looking and searching for funding to sustain an MLP. I want to sincerely thank our guest panelists today, Ann Mangiamelli, Managing Attorney of Health, the Health Project at Legal Aid of Nebraska, and Brad Meyer, CEO of Blue Stem Health, also in Nebraska, for their time spent today sharing with our audience best practices, tips, so that you too can be successful in uh, carrying out your medical legal partnership approach. Uh, look forward to the next parts of the series coming out uh, throughout uh, the winter and spring. Um, to all of you in healthcare and civil legal services who joined us today, thank you too for all you've done to keep us healthy, strong, and safe throughout uh, the last couple of years of this pandemic. That's it. That's a wrap, everyone. Take care.